Hello and welcome to MO Development Session 24. So, today we are going to wrap up CGS. Um, as much as is practical, I'm going to implement a couple final features, um, and I'm going to leave some of the more complex positioning stuff to when it's actually being used to do that stuff, if that makes sense. It gets complicated when you have a product like this, um, uh, that is actually, you know, has a very broad scope to implement it in its entirety without having some time to play with it. So I do want to finish up some um, some features that I think are really important. One in particular is the concept of an absolute position um, for our elements. If you are familiar with HTML and CSS, you should know what I mean. If you're not, Basically, an absolute position of an element removes it from the flow of the document and allows you to position it anywhere on the screen. The next thing I want to go ahead and do is implement automatic margins. And what I mean by that is um, in CSS, if you have a fixed width and a margin auto on either left or right, what it'll do is it'll center that element with its parent. Now, that's a very common thing to do in UIs, so I think it would be an important thing to implement with CGS. So, um, let's go ahead and do that. I'm first going to jump into my properties and make sure that my margin property actually handles the concept of auto, which I don't think it does because it inherits from quad numeric property base which, what does that do? If names is left equals val list. What is val list? It's a number value. Um, and I don't believe that my actual guy here supports number values being anything other than pixels, points, percents, and numbers. So we are going to go ahead and have to change our language up a little bit to support an auto. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just have auto be something that all numeric types can be with quad numeric properties, even though it's not technically valid in many other cases other than um, margins. It will still be straightforward, more straightforward to implement, and if the user wants to mess around with the system by giving it things that it are that, well, just don't make sense, then they shouldn't be surprised if the output of the program doesn't make sense either. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into my tests, uh, go into my property tests, and let's go ahead and add a new test for public void auto margins are first. Terrible test name, I know. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and parse some CGS. CGS is going to have a single rule with the test selector. Uh, let's go ahead and give it a margin left of, or let's go ahead and give it a margin of 10 pixels, and then a margin right of auto. Now I'm going to create an element that will match this selector, which should be pretty straightforward, because all it needs is a class of test. Then I'm going to grab the style, so style equals sheets, build style for element, passing in my element. And then I'm going to retrieve my margin out of the style by doing style.get property margin property. And I'm going to verify that everything is correct. So everything but right should be 10 pixels. So I'm going to say margin.left um, should be new number value of 10 pixels. Now this should also be true for top and bottom. Now margin right, this is where things get interesting. How exactly do I specify or know that it is a automatic margin? So that's where things get a little bit fun. Um, let's see here, I'm thinking. Um, I don't 
want to override zero none because zero none will conflict with not having a margin whatsoever. Uh, this may be not the best implementation plan of implementation. Let's go ahead and look back at our margin property. So we have our quadrumeric base. Um, if I were to override set, well, I'd also need to override combine, wouldn't I? I need basically a new number value type that supports the concept of auto. Which I could add a enum value to number unit, setting it to auto. That wouldn't necessarily be the best thing to do. So alternatively, I suppose I could add a property to my number unit, specifying if it should be auto. And then add another constructor that'll allow me to instantiate an auto thing. Yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and say public boolean is auto. Get private set. And then I'm going to create a private static read-only number value auto with a static number value constructor. Actually, I want this to be an automatic property. And then I'll set auto to do number value, zero, none. Setting is auto to true, which I can do because although the is auto private setter private, I'm still allowed to modify it within my static constructor because it's within the same type. Okay, so that means that what I could do is I could jump back into my CGS tree and um, huh. Uh, you having issues, CPTron? Well, you can't hear me, can you? So I don't know why I'm talking to you. Let me check one thing. Oh, hey, look. Go to meetings. Web interface is down. Well, that's... Oh, there it goes. Uh, you should be able to get in. Okay, so for ident, nah, this is getting way too ugly. I'm just gonna do it right. I'm getting it really ugly really quick. I'm not going to sacrifice the integrity of my language just to make the implementation of margin property not have to be essentially a copy paste of quad numeric property base. Um, I would rather copy and paste this entire implementation than mess up my margin property or mess up my entire concept of what a number is. Yeah, I mean, pretty much most design encoding is trade-offs. There are trade-offs. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and have this do property base, and then I'm just going to paste everything in here. And hey, look, we have a bunch of stuff. You are going to be public. And everything should compile except you are taking in quad numeric margin property. You want to take in margin property. Okay, so here's my margin property. Now, I have my numeric direction number value. I do want to. Um, see here. So I have the number property. I'm going to go ahead and create another value object. What should I call it? 
um, margin number or auto number or autoable number. Autoable number, I like it. Um, yeah, that should work. Okay, so what do I need? Um, really, really, audible number is a number. Um, I'm going to go ahead and inherit from number value. That's kind of nice. Um, then I'm going to have number value have its type be virtual so that I can overwrite it right here. And what are you complaining about? Oh, you need a constructor. Okay, so then I'll have my constructor there, and then inside audible number I will also have a public bool is auto. So how's everyone thinking so far, or what's everyone thinking so far of this particular implementation of the ability to have auto numbers? Is anybody hating on me right now, or is this pretty straightforward? See, I can't even type anymore. Why can't I type? Uh, negative one implementation, it just carries no semantic value at all to my um, to my code base. It become a little bit confusing. Okay. So that should go ahead and inherit everything. Um, I do want to go ahead and override my two string, however. Um, oh, come on. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, two string, and I'm going to say if is auto return auto. I don't know why I'm doing that in the two lines. If is auto, then return auto. Otherwise, return base to string. There. So here's my audible number. It's a really dumb name, but I couldn't think of anything better. Well, it's not that bad of a name. I mean, I just it just sounds dumb. Okay, let's go ahead and change our implementation here of our what we copy and pasted from quad numeric and do audible number. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so you are going to be casting to a number value. So we're retrieving a number value. Um, I'm going to go ahead and in my audible number, I'm going to add another constructor uh, that takes in a number value value. And it's going to be value dot value value dot unit. So that way I can go ahead and instantiate that, like this. Come on. Come on. There you go. Oh, wonderful. You know what? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use link. I'm going to say values cast number value, actually no, I'm going to say values.select, oh come on, there you go, I'm going to say select, I'm going to say if, or I'm going to say var ident value equals t as identifier value, if ident value dot is not null, and ident value dot value uh, equals auto in a invariant culture ignore case, then we are going to return auto, audible, auto able. How do you even pronounce that? I have no idea. We're going to return that. Um, I'm actually going to do something different here. 
here. Uh, do that. Uh, do this. And if it does not, then I'm going to say log dot log and new wait a sec. log item level error. Um, statement is redundant. Okay, next up I'm going to do number value equals t as number value. If number value does not equal null, then return a new audible number copying my number value. Now, if it reaches this, that means they did not provide an identifier that was auto or they did not provide a Thing. I don't even need to repeat this particular line or return null here. In fact, I can go ahead and merge those if statements, toss this in and else, and then put the log here and say invalid value blah blah. And this instead of my dead value is going to be t. And then return null. Uh, why is that else grayed out? That doesn't make any sense. Oh. What else is unneeded? What am I thinking? Well, technically could... Nah, I don't care. Okay, so now we have this. Let's go ahead and format it a little bit better. I'm going to change the name of that parameter. I'm going to bring this down. I don't know why ReSharp is doing this to me. Um... We want to remove that cast there, and we want to go ahead and do a dot two list. Now, if any of the items that were returned by the select are null, we want to exit out of this set method because that means there is an error. So I can simply say if val list dot any, then simply abort. Okay, so actually, technically, that should make pretty much everything automatically start working. Um, so that means our margin left should be number value, number value, number value. That brings up one other thing. I do have to go ahead and override my equals implementation. My equals implementation, we have a protected bool equals number value other. Um, This is where things get annoying. Blah, blah, blah. Equals object. Uh, do not equal this get type. Return false. That's fine. Return equals number value object. That's not fine. I need to go ahead and override both of these for my audible number. Which is actually very simple to do because I just have to go in here, hit Alt, insert, uh, E, space. And then, as far as comparing, uh, hold on. I wonder if I went back into here, deleted all this stuff, added it again, and say, equals or subtype. You know, that should work. And then I can go ahead and say um, return other dot uh, unit equals unit and other dot value equals value. And then I can make this virtual. And what are you complaining about? Comparison of floating point numbers. I don't care. Shut up back to audible numbers. I'm going to create an overriding member for my equals. Um, actually, maybe I don't have to. Maybe ReSharper will be smart enough to do this. 
uh, if base equals other and is auto equals other. I think that's exactly the behavior that I want. So if I jump back into my property tests, these comparisons should still work because technically a audible number should compare with the number value just fine. However, to do the margin right, I would need to compare to audible number dot auto. Now let's go ahead and launch market because I didn't click on the right thing. Um, wait for it to come up so I can close it. Uh, let's go ahead and run my tests and see how many things I broke. Once I fix that, ah, I need a, a two unity implementation on my new margin because it's no longer a quad numeric property. That's fine. Uh, quad numeric property base margin property. There we go. Now everything compiles. Let's go ahead and run the test, see how many things we broke. We broke three property tests. One of those didn't run. Let me go ahead and run them all again. Okay, so we pretty much broke everything that had to do with margins. <laughs> Expected object to be 10 pixels, but found 10 pixels instead. Wonderful. So let's go ahead and figure out why my... Um, Oh, my thing isn't working. Jump back into number value. So if I were to invoke the equals method, let's let's see actually exactly which equals method is getting invoked. That would be a lot easier uh, than trying to read through this code. So I can just use the debugger for that by going into my quad numeric, no, going into my audible number, jumping into my equals, setting a breakpoint here, setting a breakpoint here. Um, and debugging the test. Let's see what happens. Okay, we had a breakpoint there for some reason. Alright, so we get the override bool equals. That makes sense. The object that's coming in is a number, which is nice. Um, and we fail right here. And that's because we are not implementing our equals methods properly. Let me try to do this instead. No, equals, oh, great. Let me go ahead and modify this equals method a little bit, change its behavior. I would consider an audible number to be equal to a number value if um, the auto is set to false and the two other things match. So what I could quite easily do instead of this is I could say if we are not auto our number value equals obj ah, come on uh, nope stop this madness as number value I can say if it's, auto, is, if it's not auto and number value does not equal null, then simply defer to the number values equals method. Actually, what I could do instead of this, I could do base dot equals passing in number value. Otherwise, the types will have to match. And hey, look, all of our tests passed now. Okay, so all that changed really. Everything else should work exactly as it did before. I shouldn't need to change any of the, uh, the logic anywhere. But what I can do now is I can jump into my CGS GUI builder and detect if an element has a auto margin, which is, well, the whole point of this exercise. So, what we need to do is inside of our block level element method, we need to get our parent rectangle, and if we are um, get our parent rectangle, and if we're set to a margin auto on either left or right, 
we need to, and we have a fixed width, we need to set our, reset our width to something else. So let's think about how exactly we're even going to do that. Let's see. Um, what we could do is we could just modify the Gooey Styles margins directly. Let's see here. Now we should be able to get our parent wrecked. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get our parent wrecked until... the render action is finished. Oh well, let's just start throwing code at the problem and see what happens. And so is a good way to go. So before we do this, we need to go ahead and calculate our margins. I'm going to go ahead and leave this in a, um, a, di a different method simply because this is going to be a fairly complex method, or it might be, I don't know. Uh, we need to pass in the element because we need to get the element's parent rectangle. We need to pass in the style too. Okay. So we have our calculate margins method. Now, first thing we need to do is we need to detect if we even need to calculate our margins. And that's going to be true if either left or right are set to auto and we have a fixed width. So I'm going to say if GUI style fixed width. Do I ever set that? Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, so if uh, GUI style fixed width does not equal zero, then return. Or sorry, if it equals zero. Okay, so if we saw fixed width is zero, then we return because we have nothing to do. Next up, let's go ahead and get our margin style out of our computed style. So margin get prop or style get property margin property. Um, if margin dot left is not auto, and margin dot right is auto. Hmm. Calculations are going to be the exact same. The only difference is, is going to be. Let me see, we need. What do we need to calculate this? We need the width of the current element. We need the width of the parent element. The current element with the parent element. The current margins. If it's auto, then we set it to. half the width minus half the other width. So we can break this out into a, another function. I can go and say margin dot left equals um, calculate auto margin for what do we need? We'll need the margin, the current margin left. No, we won't. We won't need the current margin left. We'll need the width of the parent rect and our current width. Now our current width is going to be GUI style dot fixed width, and then we need the parent rect, which I know I don't have yet. I'm just writing out some code real fast. And what are you complaining about? Blah 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 blah. The access accessor is inaccessible. Okay, so we need to simply write this a little bit differently. That is because I'm using the wrong thing. How do you guys let me do that? Uh, margin left equals that, and margin right equals that. Um, passing in our, we don't need our existing margin at all, actually. Oh yes, we do. We need our existing margin because we need to know if margin left is auto, and if margin right is auto. So we can go ahead and write our calculate auto margins. Uh, parent rect is going to be a rect. Okay, and that's an int. Is that correct? Yeah, it's an int. Okay, so current with parent rect. 
Um, how do we get our parent wrecked? Well, we do have this awesome wrecked cache, which I'm going to go ahead and write a method public wrecked get parent get wrecked for element parent element element. Um, I'm going to say if element dot parent is null, then return default wrecked. Otherwise, return rec cache try get value element parent unique ID out uh, rect result out result. If this returns true, we return result. Otherwise, we return default rect. So now, if I come back here, I can go ahead and say var parent rect equals uh, rect cache dot get rect for element parent, passing an element. That should really be all I need. Um, now, as far as calculating the auto margin, to calculate the auto margin, we need to take, oh, wonderful, give me a sec. I find it's helpful to do something like this. Okay, so let's say this is our parent And then inside of it, we have an element that is, I don't know, that long. I know this is really probably weird seeing me do this, but this really does, this exercise, or kind of exercise, really does help with figuring the layout out correctly. Um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, one, ah, stupid tabs. One, two, three, four, five, good. Okay, so let's just toss in one more for our child. Um, and then to make this more accurate, we're not actually centering vertically. Okay, so we need to calculate, this is assuming that our parent width is, let's say 500, our child width is 200, and our child's left and right margins are auto. That means the margins for both left and right need to be basically the parent width subtracted by the client width, child width. Is that true? Anyone? I think it's true. Sounds like something that would make sense, right? Unless everyone's asleep by now. Let's see here. So take the parent with... No, no, wait a sec, that can't be true. Because, look at that. Now the diagram is... See, what we need to do is we need to figure out what this space is, and that space is going to be determined by the width of the parent divided in half, subtracted by half of the width of the child. I can't believe I didn't know that off the top of my head. That's like centering 101. Um, okay, so we do parent rect dot width divided in half, um, subtracted by, yeah, order of operations should take care of this. Yeah, that should be it. Um, and then I'm going to cast it into an integer. Alright, let's see what happens. Go ahead and fire up our scene. I'm going to fire up our screen and I'm going to fire up Mr. Sublime text so that I can edit my style sheet once 
just decides to stop being a pain. Come on. You can do it. Okay, so there you are. Let's go back into Unity, fire up my style sheet. Show an explorer. Bring you down here. Uh, set your syntax highlighting to less. And hit run. Okay, so I could only, uh, well, at this point, I can only actually center um, block level elements. But I'm thinking that I should also be able to center inline elements because inline elements aren't really inline elements in the same sense as HTML and CSS. But theoretically, they should be able to be centered by the exact same rules. Now, fortunately, that's very simple to implement simply by copying and pasting this line and dumping it. Wait a sec. So I want to calculate margins before I do that. And hey, look, code reuse. Woo! I feel special. All right, and make sure to build because I always forget to build. Nobody reminded me this time. I had to remind myself. It's kind of okay. So I have this hey there. I believe hey there is a h1. Is he? No, he's a button. Let's make him. That ah, doesn't matter. Let's leave him as a button. So. Let's go ahead and style my button. I'm going to say uh, button. I'm going to give you a width of 100 pixels. Let's give him a padding of 10 pixels and a background of dark gray and a foreground of light. Um, of course, that's styling those. I'm going to actually do an immediate descendant selector on that. Oh, of course, I don't have immediate descendant selectors implemented with rule nesting. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, so instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm actually going to change the type of my thing to an H1 and say this is a heading. Jump back into Unity and then I'm going to style my H1. And hey, look, I have my heading. So if I wanted to, I could go ahead and give him a margin bottom of 20 pixels, which would be nice. But I want him to be centered. So let's go ahead and give him a margin left of auto. And hey, look. Giving him that margin left of auto actually does push him over, but it should still... No, because I have the fixed width. No, giving him margin left of auto should push him over. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I've never actually in CSS given an element a margin left of auto and not a margin right of auto, so I'm not actually even sure what exactly the behavior of that's supposed to be. Um... So, what I'm going to do, margin property set method. Margin property set method looks like this. The only thing that's different between this and the quad numeric property is that I have this little, um, this little map right here that takes in values and converts it from identifiers or numbers into audible numbers.
Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do an experiment. Because again, I actually do not know exactly what happens when you have a margin left and not a margin right set to auto in CSS. Sounds like something I should know, but it's not because, well, I've never done that before. Never had a need to. So I'm going to go ahead and jump on my desktop, create a 13 millionth new folder. What am I up to? New folder 7. Uh, let's go ahead and do not create an ATL MSC trace tool settings file. I want you to create a text pocket file. Uh, HTML. Okay, so here's my HTML. Let's go ahead and give it a doc type. Um, a head, whoops, not a head. An HTML. Come on, there you go. Um, so in the body, I'm going to say div class equals whoa right there in my styles I'm going to go ahead and say whoa has a margin left of auto and a width of 200 pixels, a background of red and a padding of 10 pixels okay so it looks like, just by setting margin left to auto, well, come on, there you go. Yeah, it does what I thought it would do, which is move it all the way to the right-hand side of the page. Never actually done that. That's a neat little trick, neat little alternative to floating, I suppose, if you don't actually need any content to be um, uh, on the same uh, level. So I assume if I say margin right to auto, that won't have any effect because that's going to be the default behavior. And if I set both margin left and margin right to auto, we get it in the center. So that means my margin calculation code needs to be a little bit more complex. Because what I need to do is back in here, um, if the margin left is auto, so this is a center, so I'm going to say calculate center. Um, I wonder actually if I is Resharper smart enough to do this? Ah, close enough. There we go. Okay, so we have a calculate center, but we also need to be able to calculate the left bounds of something, or the right bounds of something. So how would we calculate that? If we jump back into my awesome notepad window, let's figure that out. So that's if we have margin left and margin right both set to auto. But if we move this all the way over for a margin left, what happens? What happens is, is we basically just have the width of the parent subtracted by the width of the child, and that will give us our left margin. So we need to throw in some conditional code in here. If the left is auto and the margin right is auto, then we do what we were doing before. Otherwise, if it's just the left that's auto, which I can reformat this if statement to make it a little a little bit more straightforward. and say if margin right is auto. Otherwise, what we need to do is we need to say GUI style margin dot left equals basically the parent width dot parent rec dot width subtracted by our GUI style fixed width. And you don't like that because I used floats and you used integers. And then let's go ahead and invert that if statement to clear up our indentation a little bit. Okay, so now if I were to go ahead and build, jump back into Unity and hit Run, we now have a really... St it jumps. Well, that's not ideal. So, why does it do that? 
Let's figure out why it does that in a second. Let's see if the same behavior is exhibited if we do a margin right auto as well. So that centers it, but it still is jumping. I'm getting the feeling it could be jumping due to a bug in our code. <laughs> it's kind of redundant to say, I suppose, but yeah. Okay, so it would be jumping if our margin left calculate fixed width parent rect width pulls it from GUI style dot fixed width. GUI style dot fixed width shouldn't actually really change anywhere. It's only used right there, which should never change. And then other than that, it's only used within our CGS GUI builder. So that can't be changing. Our parent rect could be as actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and debug log some stuff out. Um, go ahead and debug log out our width, which is GUI style fixed width. And then I'm going to debug log out our parent, which is parent rect. And let's see what Unity has to say about this pandas. Okay, so it looks like we have three cases, or the width is always 300, that's fine. But we have three different parent recs. Three times it was the width of the screen, 400 million point five times it was a width and height of one. Ooh, I wonder, I wonder if, <laughs> Wanda, I mean, I wonder, I love that movie, I wonder if there has anything to do with, uh, what is it, is it event type I'm looking for, I think so, maybe. If we're running into, ah, I forgot to recompile. Okay, so these are all layouts. That's okay. Let's just do this for a little while and see if we can notice a pattern. Okay. has screwed everything up. Okay, clear the log, do this some more, and see what happens. Okay, so our width is always 300. In fact, you know what, just to clear up our logs a little bit, I'm not going to even print that out. It doesn't matter. Uh, then I'm going to clear again just for... Oh, I forgot to build, didn't I? Clear that out. Okay, so now we can actually look at this and see if there's any patterns here. So it looks like the width and the height is almost always correct on a layout event, except for 62 times. <laughs> Seems like an arbitrary number. Um, our width and height is always one on a repaint. Our width and height is always one on a drag, an up, a down. So I might be able to fix this by, if it's not a layout, um, if event.current.type does not equal a layout, then return. Fixed height, not fixed width. I'm not doing any fixed width thing or fixed height. I don't need any heights. Or am I missing something? I'm just worrying about centering on 
horizontally. I'm not worrying about centering vertically at all. Is that what you're talking about? I'm confused. Okay. For some reason, our parent is just being horrible. Uh, let's do this one more time. Okay. So the only one where our parent is ever correct is our layout. Not always. And sometimes, 48 times this time, our layout is incorrect. Our repaints are zero, or width and height of one, so is everything else. I'm wondering if. think about this. Calculating the margins. Oh, you know what? I never actually... <laughs> really? Oh no. Hmm, maybe. No, it shouldn't matter. Never mind. But setting the element rect happens after the horizontal. Get last wrecked. Or I could just be incredibly lazy for now and say if GUI, or sorry, if parent wrecked dot width is one and parent wrecked dot height is one, return. Oh man, this makes me want to cry. And it's still barked. Even though all of our widths are correct. Okay, let's see if centering works on a block level element. I'm going to go into my page wrap and say margin auto. Well, that doesn't do anything. Um, how about my slider? And give it a width of 100 pixels. Oh, my slider's also in... Okay, what about my things? Well... I mean, it kind of works in that it's exhibiting the exact same behavior as every other element, but it doesn't work in the sense that it is continuing to completely mess up. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a quick break, and I'll, when we get back, hopefully we'll figure this out. All right, I'll be right back. All right, we're back. Um, I wonder if there's an issue with my fixed width not being set appropriately. So what I'm gonna do, take off that for now. Um, instead of doing, and remove this code too as well. Instead of doing GUI style fix, no, I will do that there. Because I wanna make sure that there's a fixed width, but what I want to do is I want to move calculating the well, if I do that it's kind of gross because I'm mutating the GUI style when it's supposed to be 
cached. I don't really like that. But the world will end. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pass the last rect directly into my calculate margins method. Um, and do that same thing inside of my inline element immediately after the render action. And then I'm going to have a rect current rect. And then I'm going to extract all of my GUI style fixed widths, except for that first one, which I'll change in a second, to current width. And I'll set that to current rect dot width. And then if GUI style fixed width, then I'll turn around and inline it. That was a quick way to get all that stuff refactored. Um, calculate margins does not take three. Uh, that's because I don't want you anymore. All right. Still horribly broken. Let's see, is it ever correct? Let's actually, let's fix our inline elements first. I'm going to take away the margin auto from my things and then clear this again. Okay, so now we're getting the exact same behavior. <laughs> it's the parent rect that's the issue. I'm not entirely sure why the parent rect is doing this to me. No, it shouldn't matter if I'm in the editor or not. Why would the parent rect have a width and height of one? Who's even setting that? Is anybody setting that like anywhere? Let's let's go into my rec cache. I'm gonna say for my set element rect, I'm gonna say if rect dot what is that rect dot width is a zero and is one and one? Yeah, width and height are both one. Rect dot width equals one and oops. Rect.height equals one debug log setting strange rect for unique ID. Okay, let's see if that's ever actually getting set. Setting straight strange rect for well for everything. That's not just happening once either, it's happening, it's already happened 16 times. Oh, I hate immediate mode GUIs. repeatedly doing this, which is weird. Now if I leave it alone, I mean that's correct. Let's go ahead and verify that's correct. I'm going to give my page wrap a background of RGBA 0, 0, 0. 0.3. Okay, that's not actually correct. But it's close enough. My calculations are wrong, it doesn't matter. Um, it's continuously setting those strange rectangles. Why is it doing this? I wonder if I just ignore these rectangles, what would happen? It's a 
little better. Um, looks like my layouts and my repaints are getting the correct rectangle most of the time. Why would it do this? Um, so if I come back here and ignore everything but repaints, it should mostly be okay, but I'm not super excited about the concept of mostly. Still not working. My H1 has a margin left and margin right, both in auto. Hey, look, I forgot to shut down Gmail. Those notifications do look really cool, though. Um, where was I? What was I, what was I even doing? Oh, I was doing this. Um, let's go ahead and do that and see if that changes it. Because maybe I won't even need to have this horrible bit of code in if I do this. Um, okay, well, there's no flickering. Um, parent rect is not correct, however. At least there's no flickering. Why isn't the parent wrecked? Okay, can somebody tell me why it's working now? Well, it's not working, but... Oh, it's definitely not even close to working. Well, it's getting there. But why? None of the parent wrecks are correct, though. Cache get rectangle for element parent. Element last wrecked, wrecked equals get last wrecked. Oh great, it's flickering again. It's like when I click down, it snaps out of place, then it comes back. But even so, the widths are never actually correct. Neither are the heights for the parent rectangles. Like, you can't even find them from the rect cache. All right. 
I'll figure this out next week. Let's go ahead and wrap up with getting um, getting the deploy scripts working for deploying CGS. We can go ahead and do that in the next 30 minutes and actually get something done here today. And then next week I'll figure out why the margin stuff is borked. Okay. So, build scripts. What I need to do is I really want to have CGS packaged into a single assembly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a program called IL Merge to merge all of our assemblies into one for distribution. It's a very common practice for little libraries like this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and actually physically locate Cascading GUI Sheets, Unity, Assets, Assemblies. What we see here, we have uh, CGS Unity, CGS Engine, CGS Compiler, CGS Base, and Antler 3 Runtime. I want all of these DLLs to turn into one DLL, or actually two. We'll need log for net, I believe. Do we even use log for net anywhere? Oh, well, it doesn't even look like we need log for net. Okay. So we just need these assemblies all packaged together. Uh, it's not actually very difficult to do. I'm going to go ahead and download IL Merge. It's a Microsoft Research Project. Um, and I can get it now through NuGet. Oh, that's cool, but I don't want it through NuGet. Well, I could. Maybe. How well does it work through NuGet? I have no idea. Let's see what happens. We'll go on an adventure. Okay, I'll merge. We have a NuGet package. I'll merge the utility. Blah, 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 blah. We're just packaged into a console application, but its functionality is also available prog programmatically. All of its functionality? Let's see what happens. Um, let's go ahead and grab... Let's see what that included. So I just... Oh, I just downloaded Dial Merge. Let's see what is contained within this. We have a document file and executable. And I don't have Word installed. Okay, so it looks like it just includes the executable, which means I have to build my write my own pa um, my own build process to execute this. I'm going to use something called um, Albacore. Albacore is a Ruby gem that allows us to use rake files to write a build process for our project. So in order to build CGS and have IL, Mer IL Merge do all of its fun things, um, you need to make sure that you have uh, Albacore installed. I believe you just do uh, gem install Albacore. I think that's how you spell it. If it's not, it'll tell me in a second. But you will need Ruby installed in order to um, install Albacore. So while that's doing its thing, uh, successfully installed. Oh, it looks like I might have just gotten a new version of it. Well, let's hope the new version of it is still compatible with my old code. Story of my life. Okay, so you make sure that you have this gem installed. Now what that's going to do is we're going to write what's called a rake file. That rake file is going to get dumped right here in CGS, in our main project. And that rake file is going to allow us to run, well, code that goes off into our solution, builds a release build of it, then invokes IL Merge. So let's start with the uh, building the release first. And then let's figure out how we're going to do the IL Merge itself, and then we'll combine it all into a rake file. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a PowerShell prompt right here. And then I'm going to jump into my project. I'm going to switch over to release mode, go into my configuration manager release, and I'm going to do a build. 
Okay, so that was successful. That means we now have our binaries in my respective release folders. And what I want to do is I want to merge them all together. So to do that, I'm going to have to invoke IL merge. Now, currently, IL merge relative to the path of my project is under source, uh, packages, IL merge, and IL merge.exe. So if we run that, we will see a lot of options. What I would need, the way that you write IL merge is the first thing you do is you specify an output direct or output file. The output file is going to be in build slash slash cgs dot unity dot dll. So cgs dot unity dot dll. And if I were to just run this, um, we get an error right there. As you can see, it says you must specify at least one input file. The way you specify input files are all the subsequent things that show up at the end of a IL merge command. So that's going to be all of the assemblies that we want to merge. So the first one is going to be under source, um, CGS base, bin, release, CGS base dot DLL. Now if I were to hit enter, we get an error because I don't actually have a folder called build. And now that I do, we shouldn't get an error. If I go back into my build folder, we see we have a CGS unity.dll. But if we look at it, opening up um, ILSpy or something, let me go ahead and find it. Um, ILSpy fire you up. Um, I'm just going to remove all these. Let's go ahead and dump CGS Unity into it and look at the types we have. We have CGS base uh, value objects and all that fun stuff. So what exactly did we accomplish by IL merging? Well, nothing, because we only specified one thing to merge. So we basically got a copy of what we had before. So let's go ahead and specify the next one. So CGS dot engine uh, bin, or no, we need compiler. So cgs.compiler um, bin release whoops cgs.compiler.dll So as you see there, I just merged uh, cgs base and cgs compiler into cgs.unity.dll If I were to refresh this in IL merge, what we see now is we have our lexer, our parser, our tree, and all of that fun stuff. So, that's really neat. Let's go ahead and do another DLL. I'm going to do source cgs.engine uh, bin release cgsengine.dll. Come back here, refresh. Now we have all of our engine types merged into this assembly. Now you'll notice that our types are becoming public. Did I make them public? I'm pretty sure I made them... Eh, I made them all public. I don't know why I did that. They should be internal. The namespace is called internal, and yet I made everything public. Go ahead and fix that real fast. I don't want to expose any of this to prying eyes. Okay, let's go ahead and recompile that and see what happens. Oh, I will, I'll have to also rebuild that for those changes to take effect. Now let's recompile, or remerge, jump back into ILSpy, and what we should see now are our types being internal. So that's great. Um, the next thing we need is going to be, and the next and last thing we need is cgs.unity uh, bin release cgs.unity.dll. 
and we have our first IL merge error. I actually knew that this was going to happen, so we'll talk about how we can go ahead and fix this. The problem is, is that the unresolved assembly reference not allowed Unity Engine. Now, we don't actually want to merge in Unity Engine into our project, and... Wait a sec. Oh, here's what's going on. The, the copy local is set to false, so it's not copying into the, the, uh, the release folder, so it can't resolve that reference. So how did I... Oh, right. So to fix this, IL merge needs to have a reference to the Unity Engine DLL. To do that, we can specify a lib path with IL merge. So notice how right now I'm typing in lib. Right here. I know it's kind of hard to see with all that text. And then I'm going to specify the folder that contains my external resources, which is going to be lib unity. So I'll do lib equals uh, dot slash lib slash unity. Hit enter. And we have successfully referenced that other assembly without merging that assembly into our own assembly. So as you see, we now have all of CGS. But we're missing something. Can anybody guess as to what we're missing from this merged, um, this merged assembly? Anyone? Yes, we are missing Antler. I do not want Antler to even be exposed publicly in any way. The problem is, is that I don't want to bring Antler into the Unity project as a separate DLL. If I were to do that, then Antler would be exposed to all of your scripts inside of Unity, and that would be really ugly. Now, Unfortunately, that gives us, or that makes it very problematic for us to do what we want to do here because we want to merge Antler into our project, but we want to internalize it. So let's start with the merging. Uh, we can go ahead and actually merge in Antler, uh, merge in the Antler runtime. Um, but for some reason, I can't remember exactly. Oh, what am I thinking? We can just add another merge. So I'm going to do a dot slash source, or sorry, lib antler. And what I'm going to have to pull in is the antler3 runtime dot dll. Now I hit enter. And check this out. We have now imported antler right into our assembly. But all of these types are public. I do not want these types to be public. I don't want these types to be public because I don't want them to conflict with anything else that might be imported already into Unity, especially if they're different versions of the Antler runtime, because that would cause, well, lots of issues, basically DLL hell. So what I need to do is use a feature of IL merge to internalize all of my Antler references, as in make all of these classes that I've imported internal without actually modifying Antler itself. So I hope you guys can start to see how powerful this IL merge tool is. What I need to do is I need to create a text file um, that specifies some patterns to IL merge as far as which types need to be internal. So I'm going to write a text document called uh, CGS Unity Inter internalize exclude. Okay, so what I'm going to put in my externalize and exclude is going to be my um, the opposite of what I want to be internalized. If that makes sense. So what don't I want to be internalized? Well, I don't want my CGS um, dot base to be internalized. 
I don't want my engine to be internalized either. Now you might be looking at the syntax and wondering what it is. This is a regular expression. So the the way that this these these files are processed is that they're processed as type names. So for example, cgs.base.wo. Um, because it's a regex, I have to escape the dots. So that's why you see that there. Um, and the reason why you see a slash followed by two dots is because I'm escaping this dot, but then I'm using the dot star for a zero to many, um, a zero to many greedy expression of anything. And then of course this means the beginning. So now that I've written my internalize exclude, I can pass in another flag into IL merge. Called, not surprisingly, internalize. So I want to internalize, and then I specify the file that contains my patterns. So it's going to be CGS Unity. I'm just going to copy and paste the name. Hit enter. Come back here, refresh, and check that out. Antler is now internalized. In fact, my compiler is internalized too, which is cool. But my base is not internalized. Neither is my CGS Unity, or wait a sec, CGS Unity is internalized. Madness. Oh, derp. I wanted Unity, and I don't want, no, I do want Engine. Now, actually, all I really need out of Engine is going to be my properties. So I'm going to say engine.properties. There we go. Run this again. Refresh. Okay, CGS Unity is now all public, which is exactly what I want. Our property types, it's property types, not properties, derp. Okay, my property types are all public, which is good. Um, my internal stuff is all internal, which is good. My engine is all internal, which is good. My compiler is internal, which is good. My base is not internal, which is good. And my antler runtime is all internal. So I believe that's all the dependencies that my project has. And I've basically successfully taken a release build of my solution and turned it into a single, easy-to-package assembly that I can dump pretty much in any Unity project and not have to worry about conflicts. So how's everyone feeling? Okay, let's go ahead and automate this process. I'm going to create a rake file. Um, I'm also, first of all, I'm going to take this monster of a command and I'm going to cut it. I'm going to open up a notepad window, not you. I want another notepad window. We need another notepad window. Paste it in here and get it all on one line. Okay, so that's my command to just or to produce a merged CGS. So now that I have my rake file here, what does that mean? Well, that means I can come in here and type in rake, which is cool. Rake is a uh, little executable that comes along with Ruby that allows you to execute rake files. But obviously, this particular rake file is kind of useless because, well, it doesn't have anything in it. It is empty. So what we need to do, well, let me first make sure I'm on Ruby. A rake file is actually just a Ruby file. So what you're about to see is all valid Ruby code, which is kind of neat about the language. What I'm going to go ahead and do is create a task. No, first I'm going to require things in. I'm going to require Albacore. Now, Albacore is a, a little Ruby package that allows us to um, execute MS build tasks such as building our solution from within a rake file. So that's really cool. 
Next up, I'm going to include the file utils module. I'm doing that so that I can modify the file system, which I'm going to need to do to deal with my build folder. Okay, so let's go ahead and define a task. I'm going to go ahead and define the default task by specifying that the default task is my test task. So what I want to do is I also want to automate the concept of testing. So let's go ahead and create our test task. Our test task is going to simply be a, an unit task. And unit task is provided for us by Albacore, which is nice. And what it's going to do is it's going to have a command. Now, the command itself is going to be pointing to the end unit assembly or the end unit executable. The assemblies are the assemblies that need to be tested. So, the command is going to be um, source packages uh, end unit 262 uh, um, looks like they changed their <sighs> give me a sec Which package did I even grab? I grabbed end unit, right? Does it not come with? You'll need to install the end unit runners package unless you're using a third party runner. Okay, looks like end unit switched around their um, organization of their package a little bit, but that's fine. All I gotta do is install the end unit runners package. And now that I've done that, I should be able to go back into. Stop this madness. Go away. And someone is eating my CPU. Anti-malware service executable. What are you doing? Anyway, so now we have packages, end unit runners, tools, and end unit console. So that's what we want. So I'm going to grab the end unit runners, jump back into my rake file, change this to end unit runners, go and drop into tools. And then I need my end unit um, runner, which is end unit console. Okay, so that's the command. Now, what are the assemblies? Now, the assemblies are going to be under source cgs.tests bin release cgs.tests.dll. Now, we are missing something right here. We're not actually building our package at all. Now we're testing it, but we're not building it. Which means technically I could jump back into my um, into my PowerShell and run rake again. I hit enter, and it'll give me a bunch of warnings. And then it'll do something awful to me. Find method. What? Do you not like file utils? Um. Find method map. What does that even mean? Let's make sure I got my paths correct. Um, jumping back into the root, we go into source cgs.tests bin release cgs.tests.dll Okay. It's Google time. Uh, collection select needs an array of options, but you're passing in an ingredient. Oh. Oh, it wants an array. Oh, no, this is a function. Ah. Okay, assemblies is a method. There we go. All right. So, by typing in rake, 
we get our testing happening in our console, which is cool. Um, and the reason I just have to type in rake is because the default task is test. I could also do rake test. Same thing would happen. But we're forgetting our build. Obviously this isn't going to work if it's not already built. It happens to be built because I built it manually from Visual Studio, but we don't want to do that. We want to build it first and then test it. So let's go ahead and create our build task. Now our build task is going to do a couple things. It's going to cre ensure that our... Let's go ahead and bring in my file utils again. First thing my build task is going to do is it's going to... So I'm going to say task build do and I believe that's valid. I'm going to say dir dot make dir. Uh, the dir class comes out of the file utils. Build. Unless file dot exists build. So we're ensuring that the build folder is indeed created. And that's really all we need to do in our first bit of our build task. Now the second bit of our build task is going to be an MS build. The MS build is going to go ahead and have the properties of configuration equaling release. And then our targets are going to be clean and build. If, you don't, if you're unfamiliar with targets, targets are an aspect of MS Build itself. They're the different actions you can perform on a CS proj such, or a solution, such as clean and build. So basically I'm just saying targets is a rebuild. Clean everything out of the bin directory and rebuild it for me. And then I'm going to set the solution to equal my source slash something, cascading GUI sheets dot SLN. Okay, so let's see what happens if we do rake build. What we should get is a release compilation of CGS. So that's awesome. We have two more things to do. We have to define our last step for our build process, which is going to be our um, uh, our IL merging. So I'm going to say exec build do e. The exec task will allow me to execute an arbitrary command, which is exactly what I want. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick message out. I'm going to say merging. Um, cgs.unity.dll. The reason I'm putting in there is the IL merge is completely silent unless there's an error. So I want to let the user know something's happening. Um, then I'm going to say e.command equals, and the command is going to equal the first bit of this. So it's the executable that I'm wanting to run. Uh, we're getting some escaping action going on there, so I'm going to use single quotes instead. Then I'm going to say e dot parameters, so p r p a r a m e t e r s equals, and then I'm going to pass in that massive horrible thing that we constructed earlier. Let's go ahead and turn on word wrap. Oops. Come back here. Oh great! Come back here. No, not you. You. Okay. So there's our build task. Now, the last thing we need to do is whenever we invoke test, I want it to automatically invoke build before test runs. The syntax for that in rake is very simple. I simply say test build. So now if I say rake build, what we get is an IL merge error. Cannot find file. What can't you find? Can't find something. Um, I'm missing here. Out internalize lib source space. Oh, whoops. I deleted the space there, it looks like. Alright, Rick 
build. And another error. What can't you find now? You can't find source CGS base bin. I'm missing an E at the end of that release. And there we go. Okay, the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into back into Explorer. Um, oh, wait, didn't they change the name of this from Explorer to like File Manager or something in Windows 8? I can't even remember. It was something dumb like that. Anyway, I'm going to jump into my git ignore, make sure that build is ignored as it should be from the repository. Then I'm going to completely delete my build directory. And I'm going to show you exactly what should be you should be able to do if you were to cop clone this repository on your local machine, assuming that you have Albacore and uh, Ruby installed. You should just be able to type in rake, hit enter, get a release build, get a merged CGS unity.dll, and get all the tests ran. I jump back in here, under build, we have our CGS Unity DLL and our CGS Unity PDB. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to dump this into another project and see if it works. So let's go ahead and fire up another instance of Unity, create a new project. Um, with a very inspired name. Okay, so in theory, to work with CGS, you need to dump the DLL and PDB. Actually, you don't really even need the PDB. Um, I can just delete that, whatever. I don't even think uh, Unity reads off of it anyway when it displays stack trace. It's really annoying. It really needs to. Anyway, so just dump in cgs.unity.dll. Um, you're going to have Unity crash at least once in your normal use. So ignore that. And you're going to have Unity crash again. And it really, really, really does not want to import this asset. Well, that's embarrassing. Um, oops, I just double-clicked on DLL. Go away, Donut Reflector. I hate you. Stop this. No, I'm not going to pay for you. Um, let's try this again, maybe? Hopefully. Dump unity.dll. And what do we get? We get a unresponsive Unity editor. Well, that's wonderful. Either way, we'll take a look at this next week. <laughs> uh, I hate you, Unity, sometimes. I don't even know which one I should kill. I'm guessing that one. And I guessed right. Okay, yeah, we'll take a look at that next week. But the point is, is that we now have a 
some basic margin action going on, which is cool. And we also have a very simple build script that allows us to merge all of our assemblies into one that doesn't carry around all the baggage that's associated with Antler. Um, I wonder if it's... No, it's not. Huh. See, so it does have a reference to Unity Engine. That's fine. That's what I want. I don't want it to merge in Unity Engine. That would be a disaster. All right, we'll take a look at this next week. Uh, so for all you future people, we'll see you later.